Okay, hey guys. I think this is the reason why I subscribed to the New York Times last year. The New York Times, late 2022, asked the most influential people in fashion what the 25 most influential post-war women's wear collections were. These are geniuses. Why did I say genius like it was plural? These are geniuses, fashion designers, Matt Holmes, Rick Owens, Carlos Cezani, uh, Pamela Goldman, just like very important people in fashion. What they thought the 25 most influential post-war women's wear collections were. And I took note of every single one because I had too much coffee that day and I was like, oh, this will tire me out so I can go to sleep midway. Like if I start writing about this, I can go to sleep. I didn't. So I'm gonna read to you the ones that I put asterisks by, not all 25, even though that would slay and be really fun. I'll show you the ones I put asterisks by. Balenciaga by Gesquier in spring 2002. So this comes, and I brought this up in my other video, but it comes five years into his role as creative director at Balenciaga. He uses cargo pants as a through line, translating them from street skate culture into women's luxury, abstracting them with airy fabrics, replacing belts with sashes, creating slouchy cool, deconstructed utilitarianism with intricate patchworking. So it's like the LA style, um, and he took a ton from Kal Sik Wong. So obviously it was a different time in terms of cultural borrowing. The Digi Fairy talks about Zen X as it existed at the time in response to 1980s opulence. This aesthetic and cultural shift instead emphasized organics, green consciousness, and it lasted from the 90s into the early 2000s. And what I also recall culturally about this time was the blending and homogenizing of different Asian cultures in the United States and globally with the emphasis on Buddhism, yoga, Chinese design principles, Japanese design sensibilities, Indian beauty culture, and what people could take from blending those different cultures together, kind of removing them of their meaning, um, in order to find meaning for themselves. Um, and I think that that informed a lot of the design at the time. And I think that this collection is a reflection of some of the unsighted borrowing of global aesthetics based on the use of the Indian fabrics, the silhouettes of some of the designs, some of the spirit of the designs. Um, but I like the Victorian corsets, the sporty contemporary styling, and the global borrowing, if you will, working synergistically to kind of reveal the beauty of this design. What I can appreciate about the collection is the ability to fuse utility and romance throughout the styling of the collection really seamlessly. I think Gasquier's Balenciaga always expertly combined futuristic sportswear and elegant romance, and I think this collection is no different. The fluidity of the unfinished blouses combined with the relaxed nature of the cargo pants constructs a confident, unconfined woman that the house is able to dress, and the patchworking is experimental and feels really organic. I like that the prints have a defined strength, but they're crafted into these sportswear silhouettes, so they become fresh and lightweight rather than cumbersome, and Gasquier called those prints that are shaped in these round, blobby, amorphous um, kind of shapes clouds, which is pretty reflective of their appearance. Um, they use 18th century jacquard, silks, and other fabrics to design the collection. And I like the use of the baby pink to highlight some of the naivete and like playfulness of the woman that they're dressing. I like him bringing the baggy pants to the high fashion runway because I think it was really challenging and shows his spirit, his youth, his desire to be free and to include all ways of dressing in the collections that he designs to create the best product. And I think that it has a place in fashion today that would be still so elevated and also the, the kind of deconstructed aspects and the reconstructive aspects where it's like not only patchworking, but you know that um, Jean-Paul Gaultier collection where he makes couture gowns out of what look like neckties. It kind of has some of that element to it um, and the sashes rather than real belts and the belt loops on all of the garments. It's just so clever and brilliant. And I feel like this was like the fun of fashion in the early 2000s where it was problematic. Um, and imperfect in that way, <laughs> um, but was able to pull from different cultures, I don't want to say strategically, 
but in a way that created beautiful fashion when you look back on it with rose-colored glasses. The next collection that was really intriguing and exciting to me was Willie Wear by Willie Smith from 1978. Willie Wear is the inventor of streetwear, known in fashion as such. Um, they described his work as relaxed, tailored, unfussy, and modern, and it was also reasonably priced. I talked on Twitter about how Willie Wear had the, the price expectation nothing over $100, just like Telfar has the universal expectation of Telfar is for everybody. Um, and I think that's really beautiful, and I think that making fashion accessible in that way is brilliant. It's genius, it's strategic in terms of business, even though it may seem like it's not. Um, accessibility and universal access and democratization of fashion is like the, the biggest talking point today, and this was in the 70s, and I just think it's super brilliant. Um, I think I like the nautical inspiration because that's really not where I take inspiration from, and also Jean-Paul Gaultier loves nautical references, and nautical references exist throughout fashion. Um, but I just really like the point of view and the ability to think about fashion in a way that it hasn't been presented in the high fashion context. And I think that really were, it was really challenging. Let's go to number six, Hood by Air by Shane Oliver, Fall 2014 collection. So it was co-founded in 2006, Luar stands make some noise. People uh, are unfamiliar and may underestimate the capaciousness of that designation. That's what it says. Combines hip hops with punk aesthetics, underground aesthetics. Let's talk about the queer aesthetics of it all. Um, there's voguing models, there's gender fluidity, there is um, completely transgressing against rules and expectations of fashion, of gender, of dressing, of um, creating a runway show. I remember I read a while ago, like a couple of years ago, that Shane Oliver learned how to make clothes by deconstructing clothes and then reconstructing them, like cutting them apart and just making them into new pieces. And he said that like, or the article or interview said that it's it's not that he's like the best technical tailor or anything like that. He just has the ideas to make something new of the fashion that already exists. And I think that Hood by Air was so transgressive. And it's like because it's something that he was actually a part of and contributed to in terms of like nightlife culture and art culture and fashion and queer culture. But um, it was just such a huge moment. Matt Holmes said that the show brought back showmanship, which was a domino effect of the underground and the mainstream, and I think it is. I don't think that fashion will look the way that it does now without Hood by Air. Raves being like popular with different demographics, queer nightlife culture being popular with different demographics. This was all something that he contributed to like the ushering in of. They picked Alexander McQueen's Spring 2005, It's Only a Game. Okay, I thought it was the chess collection. This collection is unbelievable in terms of um, performance and spectacle. This is Alexander McQueen's Spring 2005 collection. The show is futuristic and referential simultaneously. It's inspired by the 1975 film Picnic at Hanging Rock, and it marries romantic elegance and science fiction armor in a cross-temporal, cross-contextual spectacle. And McQueen brilliantly developed characters throughout the show, which I really appreciated. He carefully selected makeup and specific hair to match the different identities of the different actors in this fashion play. So they were choreographed to move like chess pieces throughout, commanded by a voice throughout the show. And this conveyed his sharp attention to detail in his storytelling, the complexity and depth of his intentions to storytell, not just for spectacle at a runway presentation. This, I feel, also humanizes the models and the customers and consumers of the brand. It makes them willful participants in conveying the narrative and identity of the brand and that season's collection, season after season, rather than seeing them as hangers to drape the designs upon. When customers are able to put themselves in the model's feet, they see themselves as part of the operation of the brand as well, rather than having the brand act upon them. You feel involved in the world of McQueen. And I think that that's really important in terms of building a relationship with the customer, the audience, and the world of design. The attention to detail in the show is immaculate and the tailoring is perfect, which means the spectacle is not for naught. It's not a runway show to get attention or press coverage. It is his opportunity to story tell uh, to the extent that he wants to. The science fiction uh, inspiration contrast against the kimono and the Edwardian design elements and the futurist fimbot looks. I think it's a really fun combination. Uh, Robin Given said that designs could appear slightly costumey if styled together but practical when pulled apart and I agree and that's kind of the value I find in a lot of McQueen's work. 
Okay, next they pick, we're skipping and skipping, Comme des Garçons 1997 Lumps and Bumps collection. Next is one of the most historic fashion collections in recent memory. It is Comme des Garçons Spring 1997 Lumps and Bumps collection. It was Rei Kawakubo's opportunity to offer a novel way of dressing for women. It followed the 1980s opulence and 1990s liberation to be sexy and tight fitting and body conforming on the runway instead she offered a new perspective of design for women's wear the designs feature protruding appendages that extend off of the model's bodies distorting their shape beyond themselves in these soft cushions they're often encased in narrow tube-like sheaths which shapes that imitate bustles life rafts shoulder pads for football players and even aquatic vegetation their design and fabrics which reflect domesticity, active wear, and even evening wear, ranging from serious and aesthetic to quite playful in print. And they all work to deconstruct our understandings of dressing and extend into the imagination of Ray Calcubo. The models are dressed like hanging tulips, bubbles. They look floral and natural in shape. Some look maternal, as though they're harnessing a newborn life on their backs or around their waists these shapes accentuate some of the parts that women were encouraged to hide at the time in order to construct a singular appearance of womanhood this collection is certainly powerful in its ability to challenge that and reconstruct the existence for women which i think is powerful and a display of reikau kubo's background outside of fashion in women's empowerment which i think is really valuable Okay, Helmut Lang, Fall 1998 is beautiful. With Peter Doe's recent appointment to the House of Helmut Lang, the 1998 collections Spring and Fall from Helmut Lang are more important than ever. The fashion houses Peter Doe and Helmut Lang both have a matching emphasis on utility, practicality, wearability, and minimal basics, as well as quality. Around the time of the Fall collection, Helmut Lang had recently moved to start showing in New York on the New York calendar and his influence was noted after his spring collection he was deemed the most copied throughout the press in fashion for his spring collection I believe that he moved his show up six weeks earlier than the rest of New York was supposed to show because he didn't want to be copied and he didn't want to be accused of copied and according to Anna Wintour those who showed in the New York shows were often accused of copying any shows that happened prior Calvin Klein and Donna Karen, who were notable fashion giants at the time, followed suit, admiring Helmut Lang's tenacity to show earlier, and the DIY attitude that he had shifted the entire Fashion Week calendar to be what we know it to be now, with New York showing first. His emphasis on doing whatever he wanted to do and expressing himself for the betterment of his business are very admirable and reflect the cutting edge of fashion the excitement of fashion in the 90s that's what is reflected in his decision to show on the internet and prioritize technology futurism and all aspects of newness in culture in his design and his way of presenting his tightly edited collections leave a lasting impression on fashion and his ability to present fresh and modern, gender ambiguous, romantic, ready to wear. The romance and tone of his work brought the European cool to the US fashion scene. There's a sense of strength and purity with the unbothered street style that he uses, referencing the appearance of the actual street with well cut simplicity and concrete and industrial toned fabrics. He had just entered the business of denim with his helmet link jeans brand around this time, venturing into more commercial projects like fragrance. So this was a quite significant time in fashion for Lang. I also like the, the level of depth and detail that Helmut Lang is able to convey through design with layering. Basics were um, on the front view of high fashion runway, and it was a huge challenge, in my opinion, to the rest of what fashion looks like. Next one is Issey Miyake, Spring 1989. This is where he debuts his pleading before Please Please in 1993, shows the care that the House of Issey Miyake takes and took to put attention to detail and to their um, ability to serve customers. Because the difference is in 1993, you can wash it and dry it yourself at home, meaning it has like that convenience factor. 
It's not something you have to take to dry cleaning, which is very uncommon for like high fashion designer clothes. They bring the price point down so that it's an accessible price. They have the fabric polyester so that they can maintain its pleats no matter what. Issey Miyake's collection was a contemporary advancement and reinterpretation of Fortuny's micro pleated dresses in this whimsical, exciting collection. The collection references nature, sensuality, delicacy of woman. I love the sculptural and architecturally shaped garments that encase the body elegantly. The use of gradients and print throughout the collection masterfully complements the model's womanly shape. The collection is brilliant in its ability to reshape the woman's body without dishonoring it in oversized, pretentious, conceptual work, which sometimes happens in design. They instead work to serve the curves of the body while shaping them unconventionally and in an interesting and dynamic way. There is an apparent meaningful collaborative effort, which I think is apparent throughout, that you don't always see in collections, and it conveys the brilliance of teamwork at the House of Miyake. You can tell that many minds came together to create this advancement culturally in fashion. I like the opportunity that working with textiles, textile innovation gives designers. It, it allows you to like inject a lot of meaning into it and transform that meaning and also transform the meaning of dressmaking and clothes making in general. And I really like that about it. And I really appreciate um, Issey Miyake, the House of Issey Miyake, introducing that back into the cultural zeitgeist in a ready-to-wear format that was like really accessible for people. Next they include Yoji Yamamoto's Spring 1995. Yeah, I would have definitely picked Spring 1999 from Yoji Yamamoto. So we will talk about Yoji Yamamoto's Spring 1999 show instead. This show is performance and spectacle based. He said it was hard for business. However, in this show, models undress themselves and then are dressed and accessorized. His work references Dior, Edwardian, Victorian fashion, among other references. He seems to question the constructs of fashion design as well as independence as it relates to developing an identity outwardly. I think dressing the models in what look like punky versions of Dior classic gowns works to undermine what we know about womanhood and identity, how women can reclaim and develop the strength and identity rather than losing it through this historically misogynistic convention of living, which is marriage. And I feel that the Yoji Yamamoto woman is complex and strong and multidimensional. So I think that this is challenging traditional and dominant women's wear as an example of that. It undermines the conventions of gender and dressing. The models exchange clothes and accessories, meaning maybe these symbols are more arbitrary than we realize and can be reconstructed as power can be redistributed. Yamamoto says he works against in his design on purpose and it contradicts the rest of what goes on in fashion with intention even without the performance element of this runway show the designs are masterfully tailored and constructed beautifully it could be a reference to growth and development shedding your past identity a reflection of nature and the process of life and what we leave behind about ourselves symbolically and literally throughout different life processes such as marriage Okay, 19. Over to Margiela, Spring 1996 Trompe l'Oeil collection. I don't know how to say it. I say trick of the eye on purpose in English because I don't know how to speak other languages yet. Margiela, Spring 1996 collection is the manifestation of some of the most significant conventions of the House of Margiela, and it serves as an establishing runway show for their house codes. Although trick of the eye and repurposing have existed throughout his fashion house, this show solidifies the importance of that code by repeating it with clarity, intention, and intensity. The House of Margiela revolves around questioning and destroying conventions of design, repurposing and undermining them and their symbolic meanings, and photocopying fashion and then printing it onto fashion makes fashion into a meta symbol. That's why this collection is brilliant. The repetition of the masks also conveys the importance of anonymity and allow the viewer to project themselves onto the looks without having too much shaped for them by the fashion house. This collection is a brilliant display of clothes about clothes and it's foundational in establishing Margiela as a strong conceptual fashion house. Okay, so the last one is Prada's Spring 2000 collection. They picked Prada Spring 2000. I think many of Prada's runway shows under the direction of Mrs. Prada would suffice, but this collection is a perfect, sporty, minimal representation of the spirit of Prada. It is slightly subdued, dorky, austere, and somehow still whimsical and silly. It is immature and naive while assertive and clear, and I think that this collection is 
a woman's definition of romance and sexiness. It's easily sensual without being too obvious. The tone and color palette is muted and relaxed with some bold punches of color when appropriate. It is a clean and natural summer wardrobe that defines the Prada woman's taste. I liked this. I thought this was so much fun. I don't know if this video is going to be fun, but I loved going through this and seeing what collections were important to different um, people and figures in fashion because I don't know. I think this is all super, super relevant and super important to people who are interested in fashion. So those are the collections. Um, I'm going to link the article and I'm going to brush my hair.